it's live, so I gotta push the knife now to eat. Live now to eat pushed. And I'll have to control all my windows and get my show notes back up. Thanks for joining us once again. I'm Sammy K. Powers, and this is the PHP Roundtable. This is a live podcast of developers discussing topics that PHP nerds care about. The ultimate goal of this podcast is to learn a little something from each other. If you're listening listening live and want to be a part of the show, definitely send out a tweet to PHP Roundtable um, and to join the conversation. It's always fun to have interactions on Twitter. Um, so, again, that's PHP Roundtable. And... You may have heard of one of the new hotness buzzwords, SOA, or service-oriented architecture, and you may have wondered, what is that all about? Well, today we discuss an architecture that shifts our focus from one big monolithic web app to smaller connected web apps. Sounds crazy, but we're going to talk about it. So now that we know what we're talking about, let's meet the panel, and in no particular order, we'll start off with Yitzhak Wilworth, and I know I said that wrong, so we're just going to call him Yitz. He's Code Rabbi on, on Twitter. He's the engineering practice manager at Grovo Learning, a mid-stage startup in NYC in the enterprise learning management space. Welcome, Yitz. He's he's actually coming in from New Zealand. Chiming in from New Zealand. I am. And there's official there's a it's officially very early there, so I appreciate you waking up so early. <laughs> or staying. Uh, staying. It's actually relatively easy. I've been up for hours and hours. <laughs> As it turns out. You're still on U.S. time, I guess. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Awesome. Also joining us, Sharif Ramadan, who has worked for companies like Grovo and Tumblr and is a PHP internals contributor. Welcome, Sharif. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And finally, Samantha Geitz, the lead API engineer at Packback, which does digital on-demand textbook rentals for students. Welcome, Samantha. Thanks for having me, Sammy. Of course, and she is she's she's uh, phoning in from or phoning in, Google Hangouting in from <laughs> just down the street from me, pretty much in in Chicago or Chicago. just outside of Chicago. So we're close by. Yay. So what is service oriented architecture? I I will throw this out to actually I'm gonna have Yitz kick us off here. What is this whole topic? What are we what are we even talking about here? Service oriented architecture sounds complicated. It is actually uh, quite complicated, uh, or it can be, uh, even when done well. It uh, and there's been a lot of, I think, inflation of terms uh, in this space. The um, it, within the PHP community, service-oriented architecture is traditionally referred to a service layer um, rather than discrete components. Uh, and the evolution of the term recently to microservices then has uh, pushed the community forward to viewing these as, as individually in de uh, deployable and autonomous components. But I, the definition of service-oriented architecture was actually introduced, or when there was first some agreement on it, was introduced by Don Box and Microsoft uh, talking about the uh, Indigo project, which later became the Windows Communication Foundation. And he established uh, four defining characteristics of service-oriented architecture, that uh, boundaries between components are explicit, services are autonomous, services sh share a schema and contract, and service compatibility is based upon policy. Uh, microservices uh, seems to maintain the first of those two, where boundaries are explicit, services are autonomous, but in most cases it violates that third. Uh, they're fully autonomous, so they don't share schema and contract. And what constitutes as a service, like what's like a real world example of a service? Because those service and microservices are kind of used a lot in the definition to define uh, SOA. So your service can be state, your service can be uh, stateless or stateful. Uh, an example, let's say, of a um, a stateless service, something that provides a well. Uh, the English uh, language is, is pretty specific here, that provides a service to the rest of your application would be something like um, image resizing. You could have an image resizing service or a PDF creation services. These are classic uh, stateless services. Uh, stateful services, uh, which um, microservices architecture extends itself to, uh, where you actually have an application which is a, a group of stateless and stateful services working in, in concert, uh, it extends itself to your classic uh, domain-driven design uh, bounded contexts. 
So do services always have to be uh, a computer running an API? And this can go for anybody, um, Samantha or, or Sharif. Um, does, does it always have to be like a computer sitting there running an API, like a web API, or can they be sort of like these daemons running in the back end that your, that your business layer interacts with specifically? Yeah, I mean, we have services at Packback that do things like, um, you know, data processing. Like, we'll go and, you know, fetch things and then put it in a database. Um, you could also have services that are basically like Laravel projects with Blade that then, like, consumes these APIs and they'll actually display things. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a strictly, like, JSON API, but that's kind of a traditional definition. Most of your services will probably be APIs. They tend to break down into core services, composite services, and API services. API services are going to expose your system landscape to internal or external consumers, to the actual application. Uh, core services are going to be busy with persistence, uh, and uh, that's really where most of your business rules are going to live. And then composite services either aggregate from core services or coordinate uh, the work of various core services. And then you have these, these small one-off stateless services as well that, that uh, provide uh, processing uh, for the greater application. So by those definitions, um, just trying to think of how I've done apps, web apps in the in the past, is I'll typically um, run things in uh, Amazon Web Services and set up a primary service to run the the website. But oftentimes, if I have to deal with image processing, I'll take I'll make use of like a like a message queue, um, SQS I think is what they call it in AWS, uh, and then that'll be another server that's just receiving messages, and it'll hit another server I have set up a, a worker that just processes images. So I have technically three servers there. Would those be con kind of considered services under the SOA architecture? Yeah, your image processing is certainly a service in my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. The messaging queue is more more infrastructure. Uh, so I'd argue that you have an application and a single supporting uh, stateless service. Cool. But there's a lot of conflation, a lot of disagreement in these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty new thing, right? I was kind of looking at it and uh, look, googling at it, you know, in preparation for this, and it looks like, like we're talking kind of almost five or six years ago is when we started talking about this, right? Something like that. About as, microservices. As micro yeah. yeah, microservices. Yeah, I mean, service-oriented architecture has been around for quite a while. Right? So I heard that it was uh, inspired by uh, object-oriented design principles, sort of kind of trying to take object-oriented design principles and make them, uh, converting those into more architecture principles. Would that be a good way of looking at it? Yeah, I mean, so if you, you, know, if you read Gang of Four, um, a lot of people sort of uh, may not specifically realize this, but, you know, I, I sort of had to learn this over time, is that actually everything that you sort of learn about, you know, design patterns in general um, is, is pretty closely related to what you do in software architecture. And service-oriented architecture is basically just a component uh, architectural style, right? So when you look at components and encapsulation, uh, you begin to realize that you have, um, as uh, Jens has mentioned, is that you have instances of components in runtime, and then you have these sort of stateless components. Um, and when you kind of tie the two together, you realize that when sort of, I guess, the microservices, web uh, microservices, uh, I don't know, term, I guess, started to appear, uh, it just had a lot to do with how you can create those independent and encapsulated uh, components within, you know, web frameworks. A lot of the Gang of Four principles in Solid as well, um, a lot of the single responsibility principle where, you know, these microservices should really only be doing one core business thing. Um, you should be able to kind of switch them out with other components as needed. You know, you should be, uh, you know, extending them but not necessarily modifying them so that you're not going to run any compatibility issues. So those principles can kind of guide your design too. You know, things like um, loose coupling, high cohesion, single responsibility. In software design, I'll, I'll go so far as to say that they are relatively absolute goods. So regardless of the level of granularity of systems we're speaking about, whether we're talking about a method, whether we're talking about a class, uh, classes within a component or components within a system architecture, uh, I, I think they're all all very uh, they are all very positive attributes. And so, yeah, I think the analogy with object-oriented uh, programming is is an apt one. Mm 
Cool. Yeah, it's Samantha. Well, Samantha, you ha you just gave a talk at Laricon uh, just a couple weeks ago uh, on this very topic. Awesome. I got to hear it. It was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you had you had given an, uh, kind of like an example of a web app that uses SOA. What was the rundown of that? Um, so the app itself was a t-shirt company where people can like upload designs and then print t-shirts on demand. Um, so I kind of explained how you would build it as a monolith, where you have, you know, users, admins you know, all these different products eventually might expand into coffee mugs or laptop stickers. Um, you need, like, customer service things. You need order processing things and how quickly these things can spin out of control for a monolith. Um, and then I kind of broke down, like, how you would potentially break it up where maybe you have, you know, one API just to handle users, one just to handle orders um, and customer service, one to handle products. So you can kind of use that single responsibility principle where you say, like, no, this API pretty much just needs to manage inventory. It doesn't need to be concerned with users. It doesn't need to be concerned with a blog. Um, so I do need to publish the slides for that still. I've been very busy with getting ready to move, and I've been a horrible member of the PHP community, so I do apologize for that. Maybe after, after the show I'll get them put up. <laughs> no worries, no rush. I think um, just to kind of get an, an idea of SOA, you're saying that like if I have a blog, I mean I, I don't think SOA would be a good example, uh, or a blog would be a good example to run a blog. Wait, what am I saying? If S, there's too many um, acronyms going on here. Um, that blog is a good example for SOA type of structure because there's not a whole lot going on, but if you have users, those will all be managed by one API, web API, and you have blog posts that are managed by one API, and you have tags maybe that are managed by another API if you really want to break right. it down to that granular activity. Right, so like your users don't necessarily need to be concerned with, you know, what is a product, what is a t-shirt, what is a laptop sticker. Um, and if you do, I basically talked about how you have these business owners who just don't really have a solid plan and just keep wanting to add things on top of it. And that's kind of how you end up with these monoliths where you're just like, oh, I'm going to add this one component and another component, and then you have 30 controllers and, you know, 10 million lines of code. Um, so if you have something that seems like it doesn't really closely tie with anything else, you can make it a service. Or if you need to do search indexing or you need to go and get third-party prices, like these kind of worker processes, those can be their own service too. Um, so things like that definitely can live as their own projects. They don't need to live as part of that central code base and run on their own server. Well, you had mentioned that SOA is great for alleviating some of the pains that comes with the monolith web app. Um, what are some sort of pain points that you might run into if you that might be telling that hey this would be this might be better to break this up under an SOA architecture um, some of the big things you'll see if you have a team where you're getting a lot of merge conflicts because you're all working on this one central code base um, no matter how careful you are you're always going to have shared code files like your routes files your controllers um, config stuff and it's really easy to just kind of step on each other's toes and then spend entire afternoons just resolving conflicts and introducing bugs into your system. Um, same thing your test suite. If you're testing, you know, 200, 300 classes or something, you're going to have this massive test suite that is burdensome, takes forever to run, and you're not going to want to maintain it then. Um, if you, you know, find yourself just constantly having to scale vertically, to the point where you're just, you know, on your uh, hosting panel just dragging sliders all the way to the right where you need to start talking to salespeople because it's collapsing under its own load. Um, unfortunately, with the monolith, it can be really easy to not realize that it's too big until it's too late and you start running into these issues. And it can be a lot harder to go in and break up a monolith than to kind of keep some of these principles in mind when you're building from the ground up. Yeah, typically, I think the advice is that if independent components of your system need to scale, uh, or components of your system need to scale independently. That seems to be people's uh, go-to barometer as when it's time to perhaps break some of these out into in discrete services. Uh, but I think the first thing that Samantha mentioned is probably the most uh, underappreciated reason, and that's when your team needs to scale. Uh, having 30 developers, for instance, working on a single monolithic code base uh, is extremely challenging. Uh, breaking that out into smaller code bases with uh, cross-functional teams, each owning one of those code bases, uh, you know, brings everybody down into that uh, Jeff Bezos two pizza range in terms of team size, uh, reduces your vector communication, and is usually a lot more productive. It's a lot easier to delegate responsibility when you're working on completely separate repositories and you're just not crossing each other at all. <laughs> 
would you say that um, in my previous example of a web app that uses this worker that that sits there and processes images, is that kind of the first step to SOA, or is there am I are there other layers that I'm completely missing that make something officially SOA? I think myself, I think that's a, a perfect first step. I um, I am a microservices or SOA realist, I think. Uh, I typically advise uh, extreme caution. I think it's fantastic architecture for the right circumstances, but that it's absolutely not a panacea, that, uh, that it has its own complexities and there are tremendous caveats. So I uh, typically advise people to kind of uh, put their toes in the water with stateless services like the one that you described. Uh, Samantha mentioned like getting third-party pricing information, for instance. Uh, that's per a perfect service for a first service. Uh, and then if you already have a relatively monolithic application, uh, break them off as necessary. Uh, break them apart if an independent component needs to scale uh, relative to the rest of the system. Uh, if you've decided to, to go full bore into microservices and completely deconstruct the monolith, uh, then kind of my, um, my preferred approach is to match those services. First, pull out all of the obvious uh, stateless services. That would be the first wave, and because those boundaries are relatively explicit. Uh, mis, um, misdefining a boundary or a layer of abstraction in a monolithic application is expensive. It is crippling when you add a network boundary and uh, identify misidentify in a uh, uh, when you have multiple services. Uh, so I put that off to last if I can, uh, and really I want want to be 100% confident where those domain boundaries exist before I start pulling those apart. And then I'm typically going to match those up with a business need. A uh, few businesses, um, you know, when do when do they decide that they need to uh, decompose the, mon the monolith. Well, when their feature pipeline is slowed to nearly a halt. That's typically when they wake up to the fact that, uh, hey, we've got a problem here. We need to just devote some time, some bandwidth to uh, paying back technical debt. And uh, so if you can pair up that with something that advances uh, the company and product mission, it's a win. So uh, a recent example at Grovo was that we introduced a, uh, a simple machine-to-machine -machine API that allowed our system to communicate with our clients' human resource management systems. That was a new component, and that ver that uh, required uh, an authentication uh, service. So we broke the existing authentication from the monolith, deployed it as an individual microservice, and we're able to pair that up with this new initiative. So product was happy, uh, infrastructure and engineering was happy as well. You said a lot of things there that um, brought up a, a bunch of different points and tangents that I really wanted to explore. But um, I, I guess I would kind of want to back up a little bit, and because you had mentioned something about um, like kind of designing these 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 fine these these play things that have kind of de really defined edges um, or or scope. I guess I, I don't know what the the right term would be to use that for for that. But um, I, it sounds like the web API is a really central to the, the whole. Um, Service-oriented architecture, <laughs> uh, but uh, how do you kind of get um, your your plan? Like, how do you design all these APIs for like you got to design a web API for users, a design a, a design an API for this and that? Like, how do you not get lost in all that and just end up designing a, a bunch of crappy, not compatible APIs that are really horrible to work with? Is there any advice on that? Um, I think that you know it's it's really important to recognize that as far as software architecture goes, um, you you should have certain architecture drivers going for you, which is basically you know you're you're comparing the trade-offs that you're making to get that architecture, um, because it's never you know it's never like you're going to do better with service-oriented architecture versus you know some some other architectural pattern. Um, it's always you're going to trade one thing for another, and if you're if you're having to build um, you know an API for a service. Uh, essentially, that's that's a sort of interface, right? So you're you're encapsulating that service within an interface that you can use to to make it reusable and hide away the changes that you make underneath in the service, which is a good thing. Uh, but you don't always necessarily need um, an interface or an API in front of every service, right? So ideally, if the if it's a you know a component-based architecture, 
Um, what you're trying to say is that, again, you, you have some components where you will have instances of those components at runtime, and that's important to recognize because that means that if you're doing something where for authentication, for example, where that authentication mechanism has to keep track of the user's session, then that's sort of a runtime-bound component where you're going to perhaps have to have a very good interface that's reusable. But when you when you actually look at it in terms of like microservices specifically, uh, it turns out that it's not actually that difficult because there are already a lot of pretty good uh, sort of interfaces built around authentication, uh, especially in the context of the web. Additionally, you, you know you can have some pretty simple APIs that are basically you know at the end of the day an API is just sort of like a bus that transmit messages between your different services. Um, if you create good constraints around your services, and by constraints I mean that you're not just saying okay this service has to receive a user ID. You're saying you know this service um, you know has to receive a user ID for example only, you know this set of range of IDs or you know it also if you're going to provide like um, if you're going to ask for, you know, say, an enterprise user object versus a regular user object, uh, you're going to have to provide some, you know, additional token along with that. Or if you're trying to update the session, then you have to provide the additional uh, session token. So those kind of constraints sort of make it cleaner for you to make changes underneath and hide it away within the, uh, we're missing you. We're missing you a little bit. Of the overall interface to maintain it over a long time. Can, can you repeat right, that last sorry, part? Sorry, where did you, where did I leave off? Uh, I, I yeah. don't know where it cut off exactly for everyone, but it was... Um, primarily that last sentence, I think, by me. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so what I was saying is that, you know, it's going to be easier for you to build a way uh, to build your API or to build your uh, message bus between services if you have really good constraints around what that component or what that service is doing. Cool. In terms of how to break up... APIs by business logic, I like to think a lot about my database schemas. If you know you're going to have something that has a lot of foreign key constraints, like as an example, like, um, you know, orders and shipping or orders and customer service, you know they're going to be very closely coupled and you know there are going to be a lot of like related database calls to get those resources. So you could do it over an API, but you're going to run into more latency issues and stuff. So the more you start thinking about data schemas and kind of relationship nesting. Um, I think that's probably a good way to start thinking about how to break things up. Um, it's certainly not bulletproof, but it's a way to get you started. I'm really curious as we as we talk about this, how, and this might get into the whole like pros and cons and caveats and things to, to kind of wonder about. And I would like to look at some real world examples before we kind of dive too deep into that, but how do you manage uh, like a shared uh, code base or a shared um, set set sets of code that like all the components would want to use, like your your business logic and stuff like that? Is there do you run into that issue? We did a lot. Um, composer packages, I think, are definitely the way to go. You're going to have a lot of shared infrastructure things, API controllers. Um, things that are models in one project, but just kind of data transfer objects in other projects. So, um, yeah, I think Composer Package is definitely a way to go. Um, when you're just starting out, copy-pasting code is, you know, it'll get you going. But, yeah, eventually Composer makes it pretty seamless to keep things synced between projects. Composer, uh, composer packages, uh, I agree, are definitely the way to go. It's interesting that I think both the two of you said different things, though. Uh, Samantha talked about infrastructure and um, like uh, controllers and more of more of these uh, um, non-domain-ish concerns, which I would agree are appropriate to pull in via a library or a composer package. Demi, yeah, you asked the question in terms of shared domain logic. And I would suggest that properly bounded, your services should not be sharing domain logic at all. Interesting. Yeah, I think I would agree with that, um, mostly because you sort of tend to run into this issue where, uh, you know, say you're, you know, writing up a diagram to kind of line out that uh, those requirements and those constraints for your for your different components, um, or I guess more appropriately in this case, you might be referring to modules, which is a little bit different, right? Because you're you're going to reuse some of those um, different modules, uh, 
whether or not they have some domain logic at the end of the day. Uh, but it's not necessarily a design choice. I think the thing you want to sort of steer clear of is doing that too often because what ends up happening is um, you're no longer clearly defining the constraints between how these components interact with each other. Because that's a big part of sort of defining those constraints. If you say that, you know, this component can sort of talk to only this component, but some other component ends up reusing the code from there, then you sort of get into that problem where you're not sure whether that's a part of your domain logic anymore or not. Andrew Keynes on Twitter just asks, are aggregates a nice place to start to look for boundaries if moving to an SOA architecture? And I'm assuming that's the aggregates from the domain-driven design sort of idea of aggregates, which I don't fully understand. Or are bounded contexts typically more appropriate? There's, I think, your answer. Uh, in my experience, anyway, uh, using uh, for coming from a DDD perspective, your bounded context and your stateful uh, services is going to be pretty close. Cool. So there's your answer, Andrew. Thanks for chiming in on Twitter. Um, I would love to hear from each of you, or or one of you, or two of you, whatever. Uh, an example of how um, you've used SOA in a real world example or just sort of like kind of TLDR version of how you're implementing SOA. I can go first. Um, so my first Laravel project, I didn't really know any better and I did build it as a massive monolith. It was a CMS, CRM, sales tools, um, you know, there was like a PDF generator. It was a huge project and it kind of started to collapse under its own weight by the end. Um, so when I started at Packback, um, Stephen McGuire, who I think we're giving a shout out to later, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> it's like, oh, I shouldn't have said that yet, um, <laughs> got it started on this new architecture pattern. And so we do, uh, like Sammy said at the beginning, uh, digital textbook rentals for college students. So we have a service to manage users. We have one to manage books. We have one to manage search. We have all these worker processes to gather prices, to actually display the books in the reader. Um, so I think we're up to like 12 or 15 different services now. Um, and having come from both worlds, it is so much easier to manage than the big monolith. But we're still a pretty young startup, so we haven't run into a lot of the scalability issues yet that I think a lot of people eventually will, especially if you're an eBay or an Amazon who's trying to break up a monolith into microservices. So, um, yeah, I don't know how much we'll get into those sort of issues in this talk, but... Well, it sounds like the good news is if your PDF generator, for example, just all of a sudden needs an insane amount of <laughs> processing power, you've already got it set up to where you can just scale that up right away, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's on its own server, and that's one of the really nice things about SOA is if something is getting a heavy load, you can scale that individual server, and you don't have to optimize your entire application. That's cool. Yeah, um, I think, so most recently I was actually, uh, I've been working on a project where uh, basically you do remote code execution, um, sort of a eval type site, uh, but basically more along the lines of um, an educational uh, service where, you know, if you've ever used Code Academy before or anything like that, uh, you basically learn by writing code online and running it. Um, and then particularly what this service does is it takes uh, the same sort of code base and it can run it through multiple services wherein you're running different unit tests and integration tests against the code. Um, and then it goes through the... Uh, We're losing Sharif again. Sharif? The PHP part, it goes through... I break up? Yeah, you broke up uh, for a while there. Um, I'll edit that part out in post, no worries. Uh, <laughs> um, you started to say if it goes through the PHP part, I think was the last thing I heard, which I don't even know what, what context that was. Right, so I guess the, the context there was that um, it uses a service, specifically microservices in this case, when you run the PHP code to pull out the abstract syntax tree from the PHP 7 AST parser which means that it can look through the code and then run it through different services uh, to try to understand what the code is doing and give you advice about how to write the code better. 
Uh, so that was incredibly helpful for a number of reasons because um, it, it's, you're able to sort of break down the different uh, context in which those services look at the code uh, and deliver the messages uh, in parallel. So you can you know, send uh, just to like sort of one service that aggregates everything through a queue and then comes back in uh, and steps on anybody's toes when you know, they change some underlying feature. True that. Well, I, I'm actually um, talking about SOA and trying to wrap my head around this. I'm really curious how your code bases or what the code bases look like. I, I'm thinking Monolith has its own repo and you make all these changes. You got branches, you got all that stuff. Do you have a bunch of different repos for a bunch of different code bases for all your different services? I see a bunch of heads nodding. I think, I think GitHub and uh, AWS are behind uh, the uh, microservices rage. Uh, because I think we just recently broke 100 uh, repositories on GitHub, for instance. Wow. Yeah, we're getting close, I think. So th that, to me, like at first, the first thought, I'm like, well, that sounds way more complicated, um, especially when we talk about deployment. You know, if we're talking about <laughs> deploying... I, I will be the first to, to tell you, and others may disagree, but it's absolutely more uh, more complicated from an operations perspective, uh, from a the perspective of a software engineer, say an application engineer, uh, you've reduced the complexity, the cognitive load, because you've you, you've just made what they need to deal with and think about much much smaller. Uh, from an operations perspective. Um, you, you've made the puzzle much, much more challenging. You've got uh, dozens uh, for large organizations, theoretically hundreds of components working in concert. Uh, so you've got issues with deployment, configuration management, uh, security, message tracking, uh, monitoring, logging, uh, different, different applications using, I'm sorry, different microservices using different versions of other microservices, for instance. Uh, it is an abs with the exception of breaking off the, the obvious stateless services like the PDF generation, the image resizing, this uh, querying of a third-party uh, uh, pricing API, for instance. With the exception of those types of obvious services, uh, I advise very, very, very strong caution unless you have a, um, a, a solid, solid operations team, uh, infrastructure, uh, a... Um, an, an ops culture. If you don't have high maturity there, it is the way of pain. Yeah, I think in, in contrast to that, um, and, that, and that can absolutely be true, uh, you know, speaking strictly from an operational standpoint, um, in, in many cases, and depending on how large your infrastructure is, how large your code base is, and how many services you're, you're sort of deploying, and also whether or not your methodology is, is uh, an agile-based one, which uh, can sort of make a lot of these you know, moving moving parts pretty difficult to, to manage, but when you look at it also in contrast in terms of um, you know at the at the end of the day when you're focusing on building out services, um, the the net benefiter or I guess the not a real word but uh, the I, I guess the net stakeholder at the end of the day is the software engineer, um, and if you're focusing on making sure that that stakeholder is is getting something you know of great benefit with this trade off in architecture, then you're making a pretty good choice. I do agree that the DevOps complexity is significantly higher when you do have all of these microservices, but there are a lot of really good third-party tools to help you manage that. Um, within the Laravel world, for example, there's like Forge and Envoyer, which can do a lot of the things for you. It can spin up a server quickly. It can help you manage environment variables. It'll do um, heartbeats on your APIs to make sure they're actually up and running. Um, there's uh, Blackfire.io, which you can like monitor all your processes, see what's running slow, new relic. So there is a lot out there to take some of that load off of software engineers if you don't have a strong operations culture, but it can get pricey fast. So that's kind of the other trade-off there, especially if you're working for a little startup like I am. Well, it sounds like if you have an amazing DevOps um, person on staff that can really alleviate a lot of issues, but I'm just curious from even trying to make this easier for the software engineer, um, Sharif, you had mentioned that it's like all about kind of um, them them as being the main stakeholder or whatever. Um, I, I would kind of see, um, I'm just trying to think, having never done SOA, like I would have to do all these um, uh, staging and production environments for every single uh, microservice. So I'm Git pushing stage, 
or um, accidentally git force push stage or git force push production on one of these services. And I'm like, wait, did I just deploy that to the users? Ah, oh, I just force force push my user service to my image processing service. Like, do you ever run into those types of things? Is it hard to keep track of all that? Or is there uh, other methods that you can take um, into account? Well, first of all, disable force push for production. <laughs> Get yellow. I like to... <laughs> um, away from Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right. There is there's definitely some sort of uh, maneuvering that you kind of have to do there. Uh, one thing is obviously try to figure out if you can go for a more gated deployment uh, where you don't kind of run into mistakes where I accidentally pushed from you know one thing to the other or you know, I meant to push to that branch where I pushed to this branch. Um, additionally, you can you can also sort of, uh, depending on the size of your team and the size of your engineering department, you can sort of focus and build teams around specific services, which makes it easier in terms of deployment at the end of the day. If one team is sort of focused on maybe one or two services, um, the chances are they're not going to make a mistake, right? And that's something that I think is uh, underappreciated, is uh, the importance of a properly uh, sized and um, organized team structure to be successful with microservices. Uh, I, I think they do require a certain size team uh, so that you don't have uh, engineers working across 12 different services in the course of a couple of months uh, because then any gain in, uh, in reducing their complexity and their cognitive load you've lost because they have to be uh, on top of changes in multiple uh, projects at the same time. And also, uh, in terms, though, of how the teams are structured and organized, um, Conway's law uh, is, is pretty inescapable. And so an organization where engineers are grouped by function, where you have front-end engineers and you have server-side engineers and you have operations engineers, tends to do really well at, prepare, at producing um, successful layered applications because they're working on a layer that they're comfortable in. They won't do real well producing uh, microservices. Uh, typically, you find that uh, successful microservice-oriented teams uh, have smaller cross-functional squads, where you've got one of everyone in a small squad who would be necessary to deploy, to uh, work end-to-end -end on the particular service that they're responsible for. Think of them as teams within teams. And so you, you really, that team owns their project, and those other projects that they're relating to, they're, they're an abstraction in a lot of ways. They're no different than if they were uh, being produced by uh, another organization. Uh, think about um, a PDF generation. I'll go back to that uh, simple stateless service. <laughs> You are uh, building your web application, Sammy, and uh, you see that, oh, wow, fantastic. There's an API for PDF generation, or there is a great package for PDF generation. I'm just going to use that because I can abstract all that away, and I can focus on my application. And you see that as a giant win. Properly structured teams uh, in a microservices uh, organization, they see the other services that way as well. Those are abstractions, and they're wins, and somebody else is handling them. And just like you would uh, perhaps mock out in your tests, et cetera, as you're developing that third-party service, you're going to do that with the services that belong to other teams within your organization as well. So that reduces a lot of your complexity. Well, that's really cool how SOA seems to be really influencing not only the code base, obviously, but it almost kind of comes out of these all these implementation details and forms human teams like it actually it seems like it influences how your your teams are structured cuz now when you have a new service you can get a, an entire dedicated team of people working on just that one service where as if it were maybe in a monolith you wouldn't have had you, you wouldn't have structured a team just to work on a one set of classes for example yeah it lends itself to it i think i'm guessing you could be successful uh, you know, with different organizational structures, I've been fortunate uh, where the couple of organizations where I have been in a fully uh, microservice or microservices-oriented uh, architecture uh, had cross-functional teams. Uh, I, I'm really a proponent of this this holistic approach uh, if you're going to uh, to take on microservices. Again, the the small stateless services supporting a, a, a traditional uh, monolith or what I'll call there a microlithic a application uh, notwithstanding. I think I wouldn't necessarily agree that smaller teams 
don't inherently lend themselves to being successful with microservices. Um, I mean, I work for a startup, our engineering team is five people, and so we just don't have the resources right now to hire people to be on all of these different services. But the nice thing, if you do work for a startup like that and you're doing greenfield development, is that you have ownership across all of these services. You built them, you know them. I would say you definitely have to document them well, um, so you do know what every all of your endpoints are returning, what everything does. Um, but I, I wouldn't discourage smaller organizations from building this way just because they don't have the resources to dedicate individual teams to individual projects because I think it's still possible to be successful. What about the lone web developer? Is SOA for the lone freelancer who wants to... <laughs> he has to shake in his head. I'm an opinionated guy. I'm going to tell you no. <laughs> you, can, you can have your uh, PDF generation service. Uh, that's just fine. Uh, juggling uh, four or five bounded contexts where you have uh, a significant amount of business logic living in separate places uh, and trying to get all that to work in concert, that's probably not for the one-man show. You, you know, you probably want to consider if you're if you're a one-man show and, and you're kind of doing this, but you want to sort of focus more on service-oriented architecture. It's still it's kind of possible within a, a three-tier um, sort of infrastructure where you can have a, a framework, you know, uh, like a PHP framework, just sitting there and doing most of the front-end stuff, um, and then sort of on your uh, second and third tier, um, you're you're doing some maybe you know with SQS or whatever, and, and talking to some additional third third-party services for like video encoding or PDF or things like that. That's still fine, and that's still sort of, you know, service-oriented. Um, and, and if you're a one-man show, that's pretty manageable. And I wouldn't imagine a lot of one-man shows are going to be... I mean, SOA lends itself well to scalability, but if you're a one-man show, you're probably not going to be building this sort of app that's going to scale into where 10, 20 people can be working on it compared to, you know, a startup which might scale to that level in a year if, you know, they get their funding and they actually build the product. But, um, you know, if you're building blogs for clients and stuff. I mean, yeah, there's no reason to use this style of architecture. Well, I came from a little bit of a uh, unique perspective just because I spent most of my time developing Facebook apps for larger clients, so there would be these really short-lived campaigns that would have massive, like, nothing, and then, boom, tons of hits, and so, like, it would need to kind of fluctuate in a spe specific way for a small app. So, um, but um, it sounds like what you're saying is even abstracting, say, the image processing and emailing, for example, um, is, a way is a way of kind of making mini SOA, um, and that's okay for a one-man shop. Those those stateless services, I think, are are wins, even for the single developer. Absolutely, uh, they tend not to change frequently, uh, so you're not going to have uh, uh, ongoing deployment issues with them. They're kind of deploy and forget in many cases if they're well constructed, uh, and so I think that's a, a win for even even the single developer. Um, the the more bounded contexts. Uh, that those I would avoid and try to, to keep within the, we'll call it microlith, a slim monolith, uh, but you can use service-oriented architecture at that level as well. That's traditionally how it's uh, been used in the PHP community, at least, before the microservices buzzword was that you had a service layer, and those same architectural principles can be used within, um, within the individual application as well, and so I think that's definitely the direction uh, individual developers I think we just lost. Yeah. yeah, I think we lost him. All the way from New Zealand. Oh yeah. no. <laughs> uh, well, actually, um, since I don't know if he's going to be coming uh, coming back, because that is a very long connection all the way to New Zealand. Um, I did want to hit one additional topic before we wrap it up with some pros and cons. Uh, how do you handle authentication in an SOA? Um, all of our microservices are on Laravel and Lumen, so we use a um, composer package by, I'm going to probably mispronounce his name, but it's Luca de Gasparri. Um, so it's a Laravel specific wrapper for the um, Leagues P or OAuth 2 um, package. So I can share it with you and you can put it maybe in like the, the post show notes to share with people, but um, it's very, very easy to use and we love it. So the answer is OAuth 2. OAuth 2. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very long answer. Yes, it's OAuth 2. Excellent. So, um, how how is it? Is it pretty easy to manage um, all the different scopes and authentication stuff that you have to worry about across the multiple um, multiple services? I mean, what about taking into account ACL, like um, the access control layer or 
user access control layer. Like, how do you, are you able to kind of more refine that with each service? Um, does that become easier or harder, or what are your thoughts on those? There's definitely a learning curve to it. Um, I think once you kind of get your mind wrapped around what OAuth 2 is, how it works, and how to actually secure all your endpoints, I we haven't found it too bad, but I mean, again, we're still a fairly early stage startup, so we haven't run into a lot of scalability issues yet. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you probably want to consider um, whether it's, you know, service-oriented architecture or microservices or not. Um, as far as authentication goes, it's pretty, let's just agree that it's pretty hard to do authentication well, uh, but you, you're primarily considering uh, your non-functional sort of attributes there when you're looking at authentication because it's mostly security, right? It's not a particularly difficult thing to do in terms of actual application function, uh, you know, to, to authenticate someone. Um, the difficult part is to sort of consider those quality attributes of, of security and, and how you're going to do it on multiple tiers. You know, if you do you want to do end-to-end -end encryption for example, on the second tier or third tier, do you want to do, you know, uh, authentication across, um, you know, different parts of your application, or perhaps, you know, an API versus the the front end? Um, those are kind of the problems you're probably run into the most. Whether you want to select OAuth two or, or some other authentication mechanism in general. Andrew Keynes on Twitter is tweeting up again. He's asking, how does CQRS compare with SOA? CQRS. Yeah, I think that's the um, the command query responsibility segregation, also coming out of the uh, domain-driven design uh, world. Uh, I would suggest that they are relatively orthogonal concerns. Meaning, you can do CQRS outside of a microservices uh, architecture. Uh, you can do it in complement with microservices architecture. They don't. It doesn't lend itself specifically to to one system's architecture versus another. Cool. Well, um, I'd like to wrap it up a little bit with some pros and cons, and um, I'm getting, I'm, I'm using Samantha's talk as a, um, a starting point for, for several of these, but the, the ones I kind of wanted to, to point out that you that you had mentioned, one was environment variables, dealing with um, environment variables across multiple servers. Um, how do you deal with that in SOA? Um, we use Laravel Forge to handle that for us. Um, so you can basically just go in and edit them. But it's it's one of the bigger pain points for us, and we haven't really found a good way to manage that yet. Um, there's a couple things I want to look into, but I haven't had the chance to try them out, so I can't really recommend them or not. Um, I don't know if these other guys have a better way to manage that. I um, We do. <laughs> I'll share yeah. Great. Uh, or I, I feel as though we do. Uh, the first thing that I would offer, though, is that when you say sharing uh, environmental variables, um, if they're being shared between instances, between horizontal instances of the same service, that's fantastic. If they're, if you have um, in variables which are being shared across services, uh, that to me would uh, not necessarily, it's not conclusive, but it might be a slight smell uh, that your boundary is in the wrong place. Uh, but uh, we, we use um, uh, a couple of products by HashiCorp, uh, who the, it was most famous, I guess, uh, in the PHP community probably for being behind Vagrant. Uh, so they have a service discovery um, tool called Console and a key secret management solution called Vault. And using Console templates, uh, we are able to publish .env uh, files to each of our services. Uh, there's php.env, which is a port of the .env uh, project from, I believe it's the Python community. And uh, between those three pieces, Vault storing the, uh, the secrets or, or the, the values, uh, console template, then publishing actual .env files on deployment to each of the services. And the services utilizing the .env to populate uh, the server variables. Uh, it's a pretty pretty streamlined solution. But again, operational complexity. <laughs> Indeed. Three I was going to say there. I need to uh, be on top of. <laughs> I was going to say there's um, 
there's one that now, for some reason, I can't think of off the top of my head, but there is a tool that sort of does, uh, helps you do distributed, um, like, sharing configuration files. I'm not sure if, if we're specifically referring to, like, environment variables in terms of things that are shared in runtime or just configuration. Yeah, I was I'm speaking specifically about environment variables. Uh, configuration, uh, you in larger operations going to end up with uh, probably a, config, a dedicated configuration server slash service. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, are you, I'm assuming with all these web APIs, do you have any latency issues as far as network traffic and things like that that you run into or consuming too many sockets or anything like that? especially on the bigger apps that are using lots of services all at once? I'll jump in again. Um, you can't escape physics, so certainly there's additional latency. But if that is causing, if, if you have pain uh, from overall latency, that's not your low-hanging fruit. There, there are probably other things that you can be optimizing on. That's number one. Uh, number two is that don't get fixated on HTTP as a protocol. Uh, obviously, uh, to external consumers, HTTP is going to be uh, your protocol. But internally, uh, you, you don't need to be uh, necessarily, it's probably the easiest, but you don't necessarily be, need to be con uh, communicating by HTTP. Uh, so um, we're moving toward uh, a, a zero MQ backbone and direct network connection, which is quite a bit faster, reduces latency, but at least in the early stages, that's that's not latency is not your biggest enemy. I would agree with that. I would say you can definitely focus on things like caching, um, making sure that you're not you know lazy loading or running into n plus one issues. Um, I mean, there are a lot of like he said, easy wins, and latency is something that you're. You don't want to over-optimize. If you're having problems with latency, that means that you're doing something right, and you probably have the resources to deal with that then, but you don't want to get fixated with that when you're just building a product. Yeah, don't be scared of it in the early stages. Cool. Well, seeing that this is the PHP Roundtable, and we've been, we're, we're predominantly PHP nerds that are listening to this and, and want to know more about SOA, is there something specifically that PHP brings to the table that makes SOA better or worse, or is it just... Completely, completely separate. Like, no difference whether you use what language you use. Um, I don't think that language is is ever really the barrier to any architectural decisions in general. Uh, that's just sort of a general note. But I will say that as far as PHP is concerned, if you think about PHP sort of primitive concurrency model, you realize that it has this this very actually pretty helpful sort of concurrency model whereby you're making requests uh, over HTTP in, in general uh, most of the time and it's stateless. Um, so, uh, you know, command line aside, um, as far as like web API goes, uh, PHP is pretty helpful in terms of not having you really think too hard about, you know, how you read code or how you run code for PHP as opposed to say something like Java, for example. Um, we're... Oh. It, was I muted? No, I, just, I muted yeah. Samantha. <laughs> the sun's coming like right in on right, you right so, I mean, now. So. Okay. Sorry. So I guess in terms of um, you know in terms of PHP sort of uh, concurrency model where you can read code from start to finish, no initialized variables, no initialized classes, everything sort of starts from nothing, um, and then works its way up from the top with every request. It is kind of sort of helpful to look at that as sort of API endpoints when you're kind of experimenting with service oriented architecture in in general. Um, and if you look at that as you know I have a load balancer with a bunch of nodes behind it that have this API where you can talk to this particular service. It does kind of help get things up and running faster in terms of rapid prototyping, but I won't say that it's necessarily, you know, helpful in service-oriented architecture specifically. The fact that you can find PHP on any device that you can connect to the Internet, maybe that would be a good, <laughs> a good, good thing to have an SOA. <laughs> When you begin to um, consider leaving HTTP as a protocol for your strictly internal components, then PHP is, uh, is somewhat limiting, and you might find yourself moving on to other languages. 
but uh, certainly on your on your edge components, uh, you know, I think it's it's uh, you know quite healthy choice. Very nice. Well, if you've, if you've been listening live and want to be joining us, I'm going to be posting the link to the this Google Hangout. So the first, I don't know, like eight people who click on it will be able to join us and, and we can have like a little after show. I haven't done an after show in a long time and I just felt like doing one, especially since it's kind of after work time here in the States. Um, so um, just hang out. Um, if you're listening live, I'll be posting that on Twitter soon. Um, and I also, um, as we're wrapping it up here, I, I did want to... Um, Shout out to Nathan Morgan and Andrew Morgan. Those are the two brothers that um, I didn't have their names in the last podcast, but I wanted to shout them out and, and call them out specifically because they said they were wanting to do a podcast and um, they were asking me some stuff at, at Laracon this year and I was like, you got to do it. It'll be amazing and they were getting excited. So don't let that enthusiasm fade. Just get it out there. Start doing it. These The, the brothers who code or bros who code or whatever, um, I, whatever you guys are going to come up with a great title, it'll, it'll be fun. So um, Nathan and Andrew, get to it. You're, you've been called out. Everybody's going to hold you accountable now. Uh, and speaking Bros of that, before code. What's that? Bros before code. Bros before code, indeed. <laughs> so this moves us into the developer shout-out, which is one of my favorite segments because we recognize awesome people in the community um, for being awesome because there's so, there's the PHP community is awesome. I'm just going to throw that out there. But um, what we do is we send out these awesome thank you notes, these, these little branded PHP roundtable thank you notes, um, and we send them out physically to to the developer um, and also a gift uh, a fifty dollar Amazon gift card and it's sponsored by Laracasts which is the Netflix for developers and if you're listening to the PHP roundtable because you want to learn more about PHP and you're just trying to like consume all this knowledge well Laracast is a database of knowledge and there's just tons of screencasts there um, where you can learn how to do some really cool things in PHPs. There's a lot of Laravel specific stuff, but there's also non-Laravel stuff there too that um, talk about design patterns and testing and all this kind of stuff. So um, definitely check out Laracast.com. And um, for this episode, I asked the panel to nominate somebody um, who think they developed, uh, who th who deserved a developer shout out. And um, Stephen McGuire was was the guy. The guy. He's another Chicago guy, a Chi Town Chi Town guy. Uh, Samantha. What, what's, uh, what's, what's up with Steven? Why is he getting the developer shout out? So Steven has been doing a lot of really great open source work lately with uh, the League. He's been doing some cool stuff with caching, with OAuth 2. He's got a couple courses on Pluralsight. Um, and he's also my personal mentor as one that taught me about us in a way. So I don't know if that's a reason to actually give him a few dollar gift card, but I felt like I wanted to nominate him anyway. So yay, Steven. Check his work out. He's fantastic. Excellent. Yeah, I think he manages like... Like fifteen of the um, the providers that uh, for the PHP league or something. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. he ended up leaving Packback and just basically doing a whole bunch of really cool open source stuff. So he's uh, yeah, he's really giving back. Very cool. Well, Stephen, I will be hitting you up. Um, I mean, I'll probably see you at the next PHP user group uh, meetup, and I can just hand it to you. But uh, I'll get your address and send you the uh, the official uh, Lyricast sponsored gift card. Um, well. I think that's that just about does it for this episode. Um, do, are there any final thoughts that you guys had for SOA or random just tidbits? Because um, I do want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to do a shameless plug before we do um, after we do our, our random thoughts. Um, it's something that can be SOA can be intimidating. It's not something that's talked about a lot in the PHP community, and I think a lot of people. Just based on how I felt about it, and people make comments at Laracon to me about it, do you feel intimidated by it? But it's really not that hard to get going. And if you are feeling some of these pain points that we talked about earlier, it's definitely something to look into. Um, and the community is great. A lot of people do have experience with this. So if it's something that you're into, you know, raise a red flag on Twitter, and we can, you know, we can talk about it. Yay! So I'm coming to you for support. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> Samantha. With, with that right. I said I mentioned previously that I'm a bit of a microservices realist. Uh, it's, for me, not a panacea and can be a Pandora's box. Uh, but when used uh, used well in the right circumstances, a fantastic tool in our architectural arsenal. So I would, as Samantha said, I would suggest don't be too intimidated from it. Don't be scared of it. Uh, but definitely uh, reach out to those who have done or are doing uh, if you're in that uh, phase where you're considering doing it yourself, um, microservices envy uh, is is a is a thing. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, I was somewhat apprehensive uh, when, when we began the podcast that we would be launching all sorts of people into uh, fits of microservices envy. Uh, and that's, it can be a dangerous thing. Um, uh, I, uh, I actually, after Samantha's talk, someone, uh, I spoke to someone at Laricon and um, it has diagrams and what have you, and he thought it would work like this, and here's how the domains relate and what have you. And I asked him about deployment, and it was him, and, well, that's always been kind of a challenge for him, and that was one of his next questions for me, and um, maybe not the, the right next step for him. Uh, so latch on to a mentor, reach out to other people in the community uh, if you're considering making uh, the first tentative steps in microservices uh, and, uh, and get some guidance. It's, it's kind of important. Yeah, I think one final note that I might uh, just add to that is that there there is sort of a, a marketing sort of buzz around microservices that I've that I've heard about lately. Uh, I'm not going to name any particular companies or anything like that, uh, but don't sort of let that kind of confuse you around the idea of uh, architecture choices in general. I think that it's smart to to think about architecture and. and uh, software design. Um, think about it up front and, and do you know your own research, but uh, try not to get caught up into anyone's sort of really a specific definition about what microservices are or how you should do them. Excellent advice. Well, on that note, um, Yitz, do you want to shamelessly promote yourself? <laughs> um, you know what? I don't want to shamelessly promote myself this time. I'll uh, put on my Grovo hat and uh, oh, shamelessly nice. promote, uh, my my recent employer. Uh, for those of you who uh, who know me, I was a independent uh, consultant and contract developer for the better part of a decade. And uh, much to my shock, as well as I'm sure uh, most of the communities, uh, a few months back I found a uh, consulting client that I couldn't leave. Uh, and I'm just happier than a clam. And I think we've really got a, a fantastic uh, developer uh, in pro-engineering culture uh, going on there. And we're hiring. So if uh, you're, you're a, a data uh, engineer, a application engineer, or an operations engineer in the New York City area, or would like to be, um, and are interested in uh, learning a little bit more about uh, what Internet, call, Internet Week calls the best place to work in New York City tech, and we were also yesterday named Tech Cocktails New York City Startup of the Year, uh, reach out to me. Love to talk. Excellent. Sharif, you got anything you want to promote? Um, you know, sadly, the thing that I would have liked to promote is not actually ready to be released into the wild yet, but uh, I could just sort of say that, uh, you know, if you're interested in architecture and performance, um, I'm, I'm very big on sort of software architecture and uh, in performance problems in general, and I'm kind of working on something right now that uh, has to do specifically with PHP, so if you're sort of interested in that kind of thing, you know, hit me up on Twitter and uh, we can chat about it. Excellent. Well, once that's done, just hit me up, and I will um, add that a link to that whatever this thing is uh, in the future. Uh, <laughs> I'll add that sure. to the to the web to the uh, to the show notes. Cool. Uh, Samantha, you got anything that you want to promote? Um, not really. Packpack's not hiring engineers right now. We are hiring sales interns. If you know any college students in Chicago, hit us up. Or uh, if you know any college students who want to do digital textbook rentals, that's what we do. But yeah, six months. You should check us out because we'll probably be hiring engineers then. Cool. Well, uh, again, if you're listening live, um, just hang out. Go to twitter.com slash phproundtable, and you're going to be seeing a tweet pop up here in just a second with a, a link to this Google Hangout. Uh, and um, I hope you guys will be joining us for our next episode. we got a couple of episodes lined up here. Um, not really sure when they're going to happen, but we're going to find out. Uh, there's one that I'm pretty excited about called Design Pattern Mania, where we're going to be talking with like Anthony Ferrara, Adam Wethen, and this, maybe some others uh, about this idea of like all these design patterns. It's like, oh, I get like like paralyzed with just the design pattern thing I'm supposed to be doing, and I, I can't just ba write a basic CRUD app because I'm so concerned with the design pattern. Um, we're going to be talking about if that's a good thing, Thing. <laughs> probably not, uh, and like how we can really break down design patterns into maybe like smaller components and like maybe take some of the load off our shoulders and we don't have to feel like we're doing it wrong all the time. Uh, so I'm really excited about that one coming down the pipe. Also, we're going to be doing a PHP internals one. I'm not really sure what it's going to look like, but there's been a lot of really fun things happening in PHP internals, and I wanted to get some internals people on to talk about it. Um, and we're going to talk about running a rocking user group and all kinds of cool stuff. So um, definitely be checking out uh, future roundtables, and we're really happy that you joined us for this. If you have something that you think that nerds would 
be excited about, like some kind of cool topic that you'd like to discuss, hit me up on Twitter. Actually, this topic was uh, made possible by Sharif. He hit me up on phproundtable.com. He's like, hey, I want to talk about SOA and microservices. I was like, yeah, let's do it. So um, I don't say that at the end of every episode just to, to hear my own self, my own my own air come out of my face. Um, this has happened quite a few times um, uh, where people have just said, hey, let's talk about this. I'm like, let's do it. So you don't have to be a, a well, like this this public speaker who's gone to every conference in the world. You can just be you and talk about something cool. So hit me up on Twitter. Um, thanks again for Sharif and Samantha and Yitz for joining us for this episode. And we'll see you, y'all, you, you peeps, uh, in the next episode. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me.